morning. Welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church Sunday School Hour. Uh, we are going to get into lesson number six of this series. And today's lesson is entitled, Committed to His Worship. Uh, the point of the lesson is God deserves our worship and praise. Our, uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come to you this morning, Lord, praising you and giving you thanks. We ask that you impress upon us and help us to understand the importance of worship and praise. We thank you for being the God who is worthy of our praise and adoration. We thank you for your righteousness and your holiness. We thank you for being the person that we can turn to and trust always to be truthful to us and to be with us and support us in our times of troubles and need. We need to be reminded that you are all powerful you are the creator. You are set apart from every other person or being. And that you alone deserve our praise. Thank you for your holiness and your righteousness. Thank you for loving us, caring for us, and uh, protecting us. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you'll turn to page 142 in your personal study guide, you see a picture looks like somebody kind of on some kind of a roller coaster or wild mice type carnival ride. And the question is, when have you been swept up in a moment of excitement? Um, you may have to think long and hard to think back when you've got something that really excited you. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're a sports fan, you get really excited over a game, a football game. We all have a tendency to want to cheer on our team, and when they run down the field and score a touchdown, we jump up and scream and holler and wave our hands and and uh, show like we were really, really pleased and happy that they were able to score. Uh, that's why the, the what's why they're called fans or fanatics. Uh, the behavior often borders on fan, fanatic. When our team scores and, and uh, other times when something good happens on our side, we uh, show approval. Thousands of hands instantly reach for the sky as a symbol of both victory and sheer adulation. You'll have heroes, a quarterback or a running back or a wide receiver or somebody that is your favorite player and it that, that plays well and when he does something good you are all excited and and uh, show adoration but there's no one on this earth or in this world that deserves our worship and praise more than God the uh, scripture passage that we're studying today is Psalms 99 verses 1 through 9. The setting for this lesson uh, call, uh, is, is uh, well it says verse 99 has been placed in a section of Psalms devoted to God's reign. Called book 4, this section includes Psalms 90 through 106. These psalms draw our attention to the unequaled majesty of the Lord who rules over all the earth. For that reason, they provide insights into the limitless reach of his power and authority. Reading them in public worship enables God's people to honor him as sovereign Lord and to bow before him in humility. Psalms 99 helps us understand why he deserves our praise and our worship. Our first scripture reading, of course, is Psalms 99, verses 1 through 3. It is reads, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, 
let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. Verse 1, we're prompted to praise God for his holiness and his great power. When we praise him, we give our attention to who he is to us. Our perspective on who God is can be shaped by a number of influences. The most important influence, however, must always be his word. When we reflect on what the scripture says about him and his ways with us, we are compelled to, to praise him with, in, with everything that's in us. The psalmist helped us with just the right words so we can convey the joyful praise in our hearts for the Lord. When we consider what the Lord has done in creating the universe and sustaining it by his perfect wisdom and flawless initiative, we have found ourselves eager to affirm with our whole heart that he alone reigneth with absolute authority. Our affirmation of praise for him links us with the well-chosen words in this verse. It also places us in the company of other testimonies of praise to him and his sovereign reign. See Psalms 93, verse 1, 96, verse 10, and 97, verse 1. Praising him gives us a fresh perspective on how much he matters to us. It also provides us with renewed insights into how we see ourselves as we come into his presence. When we come before him, we tremble. We don't tremble because we're terrorized by God. Being with him doesn't strike horror in us. Rather, we tremble when our sincere love for him gives way to complete reverence in the awareness of his presence. Our response of love and reverence moves us to the point where we're somewhat unsettled by the privilege. Uh, the privilege that he gives us to come before him. As we worship him, we join the psalmist in affirming his majesty. We behold him seated on his throne, and he's not surrounded by human guards or attendants. He sits between a special class of winged angels who attend to him. They're mentioned in other places in the Bible. Exodus 25, verse 22, 1 Samuel 4, verse 4, Ezekiel 11, verse 22, and Hebrews 9, verse 5. While his people respond to him by trembling, his creation responds by quaking. The reality of the earth quaking drives home the certainty that all of God's creation worships him with complete submission. In verse 2, the psalmist expressed the reality of God's greatness by pointing to Zion, the city of Jerusalem, and the prestige of being in political, economic, and spiritual center of the nation of Israel, being the spiritual center made the city unique for God's purpose. For that reason, they often refer to the city as Zion. The name describes Jerusalem in other Old Testament passages, 2 Samuel 5, 7, 1 Kings 8, verse 1, and 1 Chronicles 11, verse 5. New Testament writers used it in descriptions of heaven with Hebrews 12, verse 22, and Revelations 4, Verse 1. Originally, Zion was a fortified hill in Jerusalem. But for God's people, it came to serve as a reminder of his relationship with them and his intention for Israel to flourish as a nation under his sovereign reign. God didn't intend for his reign to be limited to Israel. The psalmist testified that the reach of God's reign extended 
well beyond Israel to include every kingdom. In those days, God's people allowed themselves to nurse the notion that he cared only for Israel. They came, they came to see themselves as the exclusive beneficiaries of his blessings. Over time, they began to look upon other nations with disdain. For them, everyone, everywhere could be divided into two groups of people. Either they were Jewish or they were Gentile. Their distinction gave rise to their prejudices against people who were Jewish. The psalmist countered that incorrect notion by declaring God would be high above all people everywhere. Because of the reach of his reign, he towers above every empire in the world. Because of his towering supremacy, the people of every nation need to bow before him in worship. In verse 3, it says, When the psalmist mentioned them, he had in mind all the people in the world. The Invitation to worship God had not been limited only to the people of Israel, but to all people everywhere. God would welcome them into his presence. They would come before him as strangers. Rather, they would approach him as children who had been given the honor of worshiping him. Of course, they would only come to him in worship if they had surrendered their lives to him. Once they placed their trust in him, they would begin to comprehend the sublime reality that they belong to him. In addition, they would be able to experience the blessings that would accompany their relationship with him. Hearts full of joy and peace would prompt them to praise him. The psalmist encouraged them to focus their praise on his tired majesty. They would be inspired by his awesome presence among them. Generations earlier, Moses used the same language to describe God's greatness. In Deuteronomy 10, verses 17, 28 through 57. When we consider God's great name, we're moved to follow the psalmist's direction to praise him. Calling attention to his name involves being reminded of his character. You know, when we consider who he is, uh, we're drawn to the doxology given by the psalmist. Indeed, God is absolutely holy. He's set up completely apart and totally distinct from his creation. His nature and his ways have distinguished him from everyone and anything who's because of his holiness. He's worthy of our praise and worship. Highlight uh, the main points of, of the lesson so far. We praise God for his holiness. Verse 3 ends with his summation Thy name is holy. He is set apart and separate from all his creation, and no one is like him. Verses 1 2 3 lead us to this declaration of God's holiness. God alone reigns, no one else reigns. God alone sits on his throne surrounded by his angelic attendants, the cherubim. No one else sits on that throne. God alone is exalted and lifted high. No one else comes close. God deserves our praise because no one is above him or even his equal. He stands apart in his holiness. <clears throat> if this great and powerful God were against us, we would cower in horrified, paralyzed fear. Thankfully, the all-powerful holy God is with us and for us. Emphasis added, not against us, so our response should be reverent awe and respect that comes that draws us to love him and praise him. 
When we encounter God in all His holiness and glory, we worship. We worship because He created us to worship, and He created us to worship Him, and, be, and we worship because He is worthy of our adoration and worship. Our next Bible verses is Psalm 99, verses 4 through 5. It says, The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou doest establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Verse 4. We are also prompted to praise God for His justice, fairness, and righteousness. He has wisdom that's available in His and available in His Word fosters those fundamental treasures for us, and He deserves our gratitude for weaving them into our lives as His people. He is mighty king indeed, but he does not use his limitless power to destroy other nations in an effort to extend the reach of his rule. Instead, he directs his energy to building up people and nations by instilling the presence of the psalmist underscored in this verse. <coughs> As God's people, we treasure God's just judgment. As we grow in Him, we become more aware that He places the highest priority on justice. His love for us flows from the perfect blend of His wisdom and compassion. God's justice involves having His people to treat others the same way He would treat them. When we live according to his standard of justice, we understand why he loveth it. The psalmist underscored the remarkable reality that God set equity in motion in our world. Establishing fairness involves setting it up so that we would endure. God settled fairness into the spiritual and moral foundation of his people so it could be steadfast feature of our culture. Because of God's work in them, they would be known for the way they treated each other with even-handed equity. Because God set up the perfect understanding of what's fair, He alone has the authority to determine the appropriate way of dealing with the behavior of His people. God's view of just judgment kept his people aware of how he expected them to deal with each other. His righteousness served as the companion to his justice. Being righteous had to do with being right with him. Like a person who strengthened, who straightened up in an overturned chair, God made the effort to make his people upright in his presence. Christians appreciate God's righteousness because we received the gift of salvation. We are separated from Him by sin and we deprived and we deserve punishment because we're sinners. Instead of leaving us out in sin, He took the initiative to provide us with a way of salvation through faith in Christ. When we give our lives to Christ, he makes us right with him. That's when his grace, that's when his graces us, us with blessings of new birth, the honor of being his children, the hope of eternal life, and the constant presence of his spirit to help us as we grow in him. As a result of these blessings to us, we see people through his eyes and strive to treat them with justice. As the psalmist wrote about God's righteousness, he corrected, he connected righteousness with justice. God enabled his people to be right with him, and he expected them to be right with each other. Without God's involvement, the twin measures of justice and righteousness would never have been a reality for his people. 
<clears throat> but because of his boundless love, complete authority, and limitless strength, the nation of Israel would enjoy their two treasures. In this verse, the song is referred to Israel as Jacob. In verse 5, God holds up righteousness and justice in a way that reflects his wisdom, love, majesty, majestic majesty. In light of what he's done to uphold the perfect way of being right with him, he's worthy of our adoration and praise, exalting him above everyone else and everything else. Deserves our spiritual response to his presence in our lives. When we exalt God, we lift him up, extol him and honor him in our praise to him. Notice the psalmist's reference to him as Lord. This particular name for God in the Hebrew language brings to mind the eternal presence of his, uh, for he's the everlasting Lord who abides with us in our world that's bounded by time. From one generation to the next, this title for God has come to be the most sacred way of referring to him, Yahweh. No wonder the psalmist directed us to fall down before him in worship that comes from a wholehearted devotion, sincere love, and humble reverence. As the psalmist directed us to give attention to worship, he brought up the Lord's footstool. In the days of ancient kings who sat on their thrones, would place their feet on footstools that had been designed for them. On their footstools, they often carved out images of faces that resembled the adversaries whom they had conquered. When they placed their feet on the stools, they signified their sovereign dominance over the conquered nations under their authority. For that reason, the footstool as a symbol of complete authority came to be identified with God's sovereignty over the earth. It also signified the eternal reign of Christ. The psalmist once more offered the refrain about God's holiness that he had declared earlier in Psalms 99 verse 3. By declaring God's holiness, the psalmist reiterated the need for believers to bow their hearts and bend their knees before him and praise him. The Lord's determination to weave fairness, justice, and righteousness into the fabric of our lives prompts us, prompts us to commit ourselves to worshiping him. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is trying to go. The psalmist disclosed the attributes of God that ought to motivate us to praise. Is justice, fairness, and righteousness. We all value justice because we have all been on the receiving end of injustice. Unfortunately, this happens far too often in a fallen and sinful world. People are selfish, spiteful, and sometimes downright mean. And while it's most always intentional, Fallen and sinful people often use the power given to them in ways that are hurtful toward others. We even face injustice when something is misunderstood and we're wrongfully blamed. And in this sinful world, many of us have been victims of injustice because of our gender, eth ethnicity, or political party. And our last scripture reading is in Psalms 99, verses 6 through 9. And Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that called upon his name, they called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinances that he gave them. Thou answeredest them. Our Lord, our God, thou wast a God that forgavest them, through thou tookest vengeance of their inventions or deeds. 
Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. We can praise God because his justice and righteousness are ours through Christ. Even as we face injustices, we can praise God and trust him to work his justice. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the love is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Isaiah 30 verse 18. What should be our response to our justice-loving, justice-executing God? Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Even in the midst of injustice, we can lift our hands in praise to him. Even in the middle of a difficult moment of our lives, we can shout at the top of our lungs and worship our God. Why? Because he is trustworthy, and he will always and inevitably make things right. Sometimes we have to wait on his timetable. We get impatient often and want things on our timetable. But if you will wait patiently, God, God will answer and make things right. In verse 6, God's people are prompted to praise him because he answers us when we call on him. Now, I'm not going to say that he answers in the affirmative every time we ask for something. The answer sometimes is no. But he only wants what's best for us. And he is the only one in a position to know what the future holds and what is really best for us. Sometimes we want things that are not really going to make us happy or not really what we need. God knows better. And he will make things right. He answers us when we call on him. We worship him in the certainty that he gets personally involved with us. He doesn't leave us alone to make the rest of our best of our lives. Neither does he treat us as merely a lifeless tool for carrying out his plan. Instead, he works with us through our circumstances to move us along in the direction he wants us to go or to take. Prayer serves as an example of the way he involves himself with us. When we pray, we ask him to help us. He answers us. The three Old Testament patriarchs mentioned in this verse provides with more than enough evidence to verify that he answers us when we pray. Moses and Aaron pray for God's people in keeping their work and keeping with their work as priests. He answered their prayers. Generations later, Samuel went to the Lord in prayer for God's people. In turn, God answered his prayer too. 1 Samuel verses 12. Of course, the Bible gives plenty of other accounts in which God answered the prayers of his people. Each of these accounts encounter, encourages us to reflect on times in which God has been attentive to us when we've gone to him in prayer and ask him to help us. In verse 7, the psalmist went on to underscore two ways with which God answers his people. First, he spoke to them through his actions. As they made their way through the wilderness toward the promised land, he didn't sit idly by while they stumbled along on their journey. Instead, he helped them as they traveled by guiding them with a cloudy pillar. Exodus 13. God gave them the help they needed in the fashion they could understand at the time. Second, he spoke to them through his word. On the journey toward the promised land, he instructed them regarding the kind of people he intended for them to become. To answer their questions about how to live for him, he provided them with the testimonies, and ordinances he expected them to honor. These formed the written law he gave to Moses. Therefore, the people had 
God's word in their hands to guide them as they grew to be his people in the land he had given them. His direct involvement in their lives through his actions and his word blessed them with ample reasons to worship him. For centuries, these blessings have continued to prompt believers to praise God. Verse 8. With this verse, the psalmist turned our attention to the Lord. Instead of talking about him, now we ourselves were talking directly to him. Like the psalmist, we're drawn to expressing our gratitude. Gratitude to him for forgiveness. His word drives home the ugly fact that we sinners were sinners who deserve to be punished. Our sinfulness has built a wall that separates us from him. Because he's personally involved with us, he didn't leave us to suffer the consequences of our sin. On the contrary, he took the initiative to tear down the wall because he is a God that forgave us. As a result, he pardoned us through Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. In stark contrast to God's compassionate willingness to forgive stands his fierce determination to deal with our inventions or evil deeds. According to the psalmist, God gets personally involved and addresses them with a vengeance. In order for us to turn from them and give our lives to him, he does what is necessary to hold us accountable. He takes the initiative to bring out sin to our attention. By addressing our sinful actions, he shows us that he does not necessarily that, it is, that he does what's necessary to open our eyes so that we can see our sin from his perspective. Once our eyes have seen been opened, so we will agree with him about our actions, we will surrender to him in repentance. Verse 9, Because God involved himself in our lives of his people, the psalmist Encourage them to draw closer to him by exalting him. Lifting him up in worship would honor him, but it would also have an effect on the people as well. Applauding him would bring them to their knees. Praising the Lord would give way to humbling themselves in his presence. The psalmist urged everyone who worshiped the Lord together on Mount Zion, the holy hill, for his people to meet him in worship. The call to the mountain implied that they would gather together publicly and worship him together. Being there with others who had devoted themselves to him would be an unequal opportunity. They would be gathering to worship the Lord whom they had affirmed to be holy. For the third time the psalmist turned the attention of God's people to his holiness. God is set completely apart from his creation as altogether different. At the same time, he's intimately involved with his people by answering them when they call on him and forgiving their sins when they turn to him with repentant hearts. When we think about the greatness, his justice and righteousness and his intimacy with us, our hearts overflow with joy. We rejoice because we belong to Him. Faith in Christ. We rejoice because we belong to Him by faith in Christ. Our joy prompts us to worship Him with sincere praise and heartfelt adoration. The psalmist used the examples of Moses and Aaron and Samuel, the priest, who called on the name of the Lord in their distress. When trials and tribulations came, they didn't shrink away in despair, but they did what all children do in time of trouble. They cried out to their father, the Lord. When the Israelites complained because of a lack of water, Moses went to the Lord in prayer and God miraculously provided. When God was ready to wipe out the Israelites and start over, Moses interceded in prayer. God answered and pardoned the people. 
Samuel prayed for the people on multiple occasions. And he ended his years of service by saying, As for me, God, forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. That uh, about concludes our lesson for today. Uh, a recap. Unlike fallen human beings, God doesn't avenge our wrongs with harm or anger. He avenges our wrong with love and forgiveness. The awareness of God's response to us draws us right back to worship. On page 150, I believe it is, of your personal study guide, you have our little exercise called Engage. Uh, engage is, is what uh, Ask what are some of the practical ways for you to include worship in the fallen areas of your life. Uh, write something, write some ideas down. It talks about at work, at driving, during conversations, when life gets quiet, and, and your prayer. If you would uh, look over that, give some study and some thought to that, and maybe write down some notes, it might help you to engage in worship in your everyday life. Also, on the next page, we have the exercise, live it out. How will you live out your commitment to God through worship and praise? It says evaluate. Make a list of things you focus on during the week and the ways you live, and the, way, the, the ways you like to spend your time. Do an honest evaluation and determine if any of the things are objects of worship. Trust. If you currently in a situation marked by injustice, consider the ways you have responded and should respond. Lift the matter to God in prayer and trust Him to respond. And of course, worship. Set aside a day or a half a day for extended worship. Just you and God. Confess sin. Read scripture. Uh, Go to God as a form of worship. Focus on God's character and all He has done for you. In closing, the awareness of God's response to us knows draws us right back into worship. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. How can we respond any other way? Let us close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of worship. We thank you for the ability to praise you and exalt you and, and to adore you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for your holiness and your righteousness. Thank you for being a person we can worship and a person we want to worship because you deserve it. You deserve it because of your actions, your patience, your forgiveness, and all the attributes that we as mankind sometimes lack and desire to possess. You have those assets, Lord. You love us. You care for us. You're our Father. And thank you for providing an avenue for which we can praise you, Lord through prayer and obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.